worried that the car would roll down a hill and kill people, <laughs> swathes of people. This is the image that comes into my mind straight away. And so we'd go out to the car park actually. And I think I could do this because it was a flat car park and I always had that disclaimer. But even, in, even when the car was on a flat surface, me actually not putting the handbrake on and walking away was a huge trigger. And so we'd do that. We'd go outside and we'd, we'd take the handbrake off and we'd walk only 10 meters away from the car, but we also wouldn't look at the car because that's part of the compulsion as well, is looking at the car. And we would sit there with our, our backs turned and count to 10. Then we'd watch the anxiety rise and rise and rise. And then we'd come to a point where it wasn't rising anymore. And then we can go, oh, I've reached the peak of the anxiety arc. And now I'm starting to come down again. And then we turn around and go, oh, the car's still there. So Simon, thanks for joining me today on the Lived Experience podcast. And you are the podcast host and you also have a bit of a community around the Mindful Men podcast. So I've seen your clips come up on my feed a bit and you do a regular podcast as well where you, you do interviews similar to this. So maybe you want to talk a bit about yourself and introduce your lived experience in, in mental with mental illness and mental health. Yeah, Joel, thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here and share my lived experience. And I love what you're doing in sharing the lived experiences of people with mental health issues. And I love on your page how you say you want to open up discussions other than depression and anxiety, because these are the ones that often get the most airtime. And by all means, I've got those experiences, but I've also lived with obsessive compulsive disorder since I was eight years old. And in 2020, I experienced burnout as well. So I can talk about a range of different experiences, both from a, I guess, consumer of the mental health system, but then also now as a lived experience therapist as well. But to take a step back, I live on a sunny coast in Queensland. I've got a young family, two little ones, and my wife. We're not from Queensland, so I'm originally from Adelaide, grew up in the northern suburbs of Adelaide in the 80s and 90s, which I guess is where my mental health story starts in an environment that is like like most guys around Australia. It was around a time where boys didn't show emotion. Boys learned how to, to suck it up and to be a man was to bottle everything up and push on. And for me, that resulted in 20 over 20 years of me suffering in silence with particularly obsessive compulsive disorder, but then also the depression and anxiety that came with it as well. So yeah, and at these days, I'm a, I'm a therapist, as I said, um, working specifically with men, because I, I guess through my own lived experience, I knew how hard it was to, to open up and talk about mental health issues. And so when I opened up my therapy business last year, I really wanted to, to support men in, this, in their journeys in opening up, because there's not many services that are dedicated to men outside of services that are around family and domestic violence also perpetrators of crime as well and so i really wanted to you know provide a positive space for guys to come in and open up and and talk about what's going on you know because there's there's lots for for kids there's lots for 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 women for mums um not so much for for dads and guys so that's where i kind of step into that niche great um thanks for all that detail and i want to just ask you quickly about the ocd because um i've had another guest on brad McEwen who mentioned he has ocd and people think it's a light Thing. So maybe you want to talk about how serious it can be and just how debilitating it can affect someone's life. Yeah, absolutely. I would love to because as you said, OCD is something that often people joke about um, They or they misunderstand. It's, it's interesting. I found some, some businesses recently. I was just Googling OCD businesses out of curiosity and came up with one around cleaning and one around building houses. And, and I thought to myself, this just, you know, goes to that notion that OCD cleaners, for example, not everybody who lives with obsessive compulsive disorder has an obsession around the house being tidy. For example, I've got two kids and when you come through my house, it usually looks like a tornado's hit it. <laughs> and that's okay for me. Like that doesn't bother me in the slightest. There's another misconception that, you know, OCD is around washing your hands constantly. And to some, for some people, that's that's true. That there is an obsession that resolve and compulsion, should I say, that revolves around cleanliness and washing hands. And it's not because they just like to have clean hands; it's because they have an overwhelming fear of germs. And so there's these two misconceptions around cleanliness and washing hands that, like most people, go to. And then you know, I remember in in my public service career, before I became a therapist. It even extended to if we were watching a PowerPoint presentation and somebody had left a full stop off at the end of a sentence and say, oh, and someone in the crowd would say, oh, my OCD is killing me because this person's forgot to put the sentence there or, or they've, they've misspelled a word and they forgot to do the spell check. And like, 
this is not OCD. For someone who lives with OCD, this is just you know, poor attention to detail. So to take it back, you know, right back to eight years old, I was in the schoolyard and my OCD started with another child saying to me, another student saying to me, Simon, if you don't use your voice for more than a minute, you're going to lose your voice forever. And what this did was it created an intrusive thought so this is the O in OCD, it's the obsession, it's the obsessive thought. And I couldn't get this out of my head that I was going to lose my voice if I didn't use it for more than a minute. And so that circles and circles and circles around. And this is what happens for someone with OCD. These thoughts, they just they don't disappear until you do a compulsion or a compulsive act. So this is the C in OCD. And so my compulsion was to hum. So I'd get to maybe if, if I've noticed that I hadn't been talking or using my voice for a minute, I would go like this, hmm. And I do it so quietly and nobody ever said to me, Simon, stop humming. So I think I did it well enough to mask it from everybody else. And then it becomes a disorder where it's, it's, there's two aspects to it, that it's debilitating, that it, it takes a lot, of, lot out of your energy and your day and so forth. But it's also that you're doing this for over an hour a day. So I was doing this for over an hour a day for two years. Every time I got a chance, I would be humming to myself ever so quietly. And then it morphed as, as, the, as the years went on. So this was around eight years old. And then around 13 or 14, mum and dad separated. You know, they had a business that wasn't going great and money issues and mum decided to leave. And so me and my little brother left with my mum. And, you know, we're in the northern suburbs of Adelaide. It's a pretty rough area. There's low socioeconomic area. You know, there's no wealth in that area whatsoever, a lot of housing commission and so forth. And, and so now we were part of a single mum family. And I suddenly became this notion of being the man in the house. And that was a bit, that was a thing in the 80s and 90s. I remember all my friends would, you know, their dad, like, oh, yeah, he's the man of the house. Or on TV, there was like these notions of who's the man in the house. And so I, I put it on myself to become this man of the house. And so this is where OCD really ramped up for me. And I would spend two, three, four hours sometimes every single night locking the house up. So I had this overwhelming obsessive thought or obsession that if I didn't lock the house up in a certain way that someone was going to break in and steal our stuff or they're going to break in, they're going to kidnap us or murder us or something like that. Something really, you know, far-fetched and ca catastrophic. And so I'd go around and I would touch windows, I would touch doors, I would jiggle things, I would make sure the curtains are pulled in a certain way. I'd even extend to checking that all the appliances were off, like the oven was off, the stove was off, the, the iron was off, because I also had an obsessive thought around the house burning down while we were sleeping. And I'd do this loop around the house in a very specific way. So I'd start off at a certain door and go around in a loop, even outside to the outside gates. And we're talking in the middle of winter sometimes. And, and it was just horrific. And then I'd get to bed and my brain would say, Simon, did you really check that window? Did you really check that door? Or when you check that door and you walked away, somehow it just popped open and off I'd go again. And it was a never ending cycle. And, and this is why it took two, three, four hours, because I'd go to bed, get back up again, go to bed and just walk around the house every night in silence and adding to that was also leaving the house so if i was the one to leave the house maybe to catch a bus to school or, or whatever i would have to do the routine again because then when i was away i didn't want someone to break in while we were away and then to have to walk into the house and someone be there when i got home or my mum got home or my little brother and even you know also extending to going to school and, and my bag and having my wallet phone, or oh, I didn't even have a phone back then. It was wallet and keys and my books and making sure they had all those things. And I would be constantly checking my wallet and keys were in my bag for fear of if I lost my wallet, then someone's got my identity and my address because it's got like an ID card in it, for example, or the very little money that I had. Or if they got the keys, they then, then they'd also have the means to get in the house. And so I'd be constantly checking the bag. I would open up the bag to where my wallet and keys were always, check that it's there, close it, put it back on my back, and then I'd take it off and do it all again. Because in the notion of checking, I then my brain was saying, Simon, in the notion of checking, maybe your wallet fell out and you don't realize it. So if you ever saw me walking, you'd always see me looking back on the ground and checking where I've been walking and, and all this type of stuff. But again, nobody ever noticed it. Nobody, I think I did it so well and I masked it so well that nobody knew I was doing this. And this extended into my professional career as well as a public servant. You know, I had 15 years in the public service and simple, simple things as, as writing an, an email and sending an email, I would write the email, check it, I don't know, 10, 20 times before I sent it, you know, is it, is it worded correctly? Is it perfect? 
Is it to the right people? And then when I click send, I would have this obsessive thought that when I'm, it miraculously changed the words. And so then it became full of profanities and, and it went to the wrong person and I'm going to get a whole bunch of trouble and all this type of stuff. And then I, so I checked the sent box and I would, I'd read it again and then I'll make sure, like I even would blink hard and go, did I really read that properly? And then we extend to things like, you know, Christmas breaks, you know, Christmas parties and so forth for work or, or social functions. And, you know, I, I, for a long time I, I drank and I still do drink today, but not as much as I used to. And I would be the, the drunk at the party that would, you know, kind of be lively and everyone would be like, oh, Simon, you're a bit different when you've had a few drinks. You're a bit more, you know, open and, and, and all this type of stuff. And I, there was a reason for that is when I drank it, it just made my brain slow down because it's always going a million miles an hour. But it also just made me feel normal as well and, and happier. And so I became that life of the party type drunk. And But then I would spend the next two to three days obsessively thinking about the event, worrying that maybe I've said something wrong or I've done something that's going to offend someone or maybe the boss is going to pull me into the office on Monday because there's been a complaint about my behavior. And so I'd think about it so off so much that it would make me sick. It'd make me anxious, but it would also reality would become distorted. Mm. So I would obsessively think, obsessively think, and this was the compulsion as well. So then this gets into that when we do behaviors, it's not necessarily a physical thing. It can be a mental thing too, that reality became distorted. And, and I didn't know the, the difference between what actually happened in the night and what I thought of that might've happened through my obsessive thinking. And so through all of these things that, that my OCD made me do, and it does make you do it, because if you don't do it, the, the anxiety just gets so much that you can't function is I developed this high level of perfectionism. And a lot of people with OCD have this perfectionist tendencies. And so everything would have to be just right. So like, you know, I would have to, when I hummed to myself, the, vo the, the noise that my voice would make would have to be just the right pitch for me to be going, okay, yeah, my voice is there. And so that's why I would do multiple hums to get the right pitch. And then when I check the house that I would have to touch doors and, and hear a certain clicks or thuds or, or whatever until things were just right or the, you know, the curtains were draped just right. And, you know, even to that email that has to be perfect email or whatever report I write has to be just right because not because I was like, you know, really big on grammar and all that. And, it, and this actually helped me develop really good writing skills. But it had to be just right because of all the obsessive thoughts that would come if it wasn't just right and perfect. Um, and, you know, there's a whole range of other things as well. That, but they're the ones that the main ones that evolved over time. And, and, and the annoying and tricky thing about OCD is that it plays on your ethics and your values and your morals. And it makes you think that you're the worst person in the world when you're really not. And a lot of like 99.9% .9 of the time, the obsessive thoughts never happen. Or the, you know, you, me saying that someone's going to break into the house. I don't think it's ever happened. It's happened maybe once in my whole life. And that's because we were actually away for a couple of weeks. You know, mum, mum, my brother and I, we were away and it was just an opportune time for a thief to jump into our house and, and break things, but it wasn't anything to do with my obsessive checking and compulsive checking and all that type of stuff. And so, yeah, turn 28, that's when I, I finally said enough was enough. And, and I went into the doctor. I think I've got mental health issues. And that's where I learned through a referral to a psychologist that, you know, depression, yes, anxiety, yes. Been using alcohol to numb everything, yes. Um, but, oh, yeah, Simon, you've got this thing called obsessive compulsive disorder. And this was 11 years ago now. And, and from then, I've been on a bit of a journey of discovering of what that actually is, because I didn't know what that was, and trying to find the right treatment and processes that work for me so that I can manage it as an ongoing thing. And how would someone manage it? Because it's um, something that, as you said, people don't get a lot of, don't tell anyone for a long, long time. I've had another guest on Brad Kewen and it was the same thing for him. So, and I asked him still stupidly, I said, well, how do you, how do you solve it or how do you do it? And he basically said, you, you, you can't solve it. You just manage it. So how do you, how do you manage it or what were the strategies that you provided um, in the early days to help with it? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I love how Brad said that it was, you know, he took a long time as well because OCD is, is often referred to as a silent condition. And so from the first day of symptom to the first day of treatment, that can, that's generally around 15 to 17 years, depending on which literature you read. So 
and I was 20 years, I was over the average mm. in, in keeping it silent. And, and it's because like, you know, 80s and 90s and in the 90s, we didn't talk about mental health. We didn't know, I didn't have the words for it. A little bit about depression that was starting to appear, but no, yeah, definitely not OCD or anything like that. And so the first time I went to a psychologist, it was all around cognitive behavioral therapy. And even though I had these OCD, like they weren't, I don't think they were targeting that. They were targeting more the depression. So we're doing things like the thought journals and, and like most people, I, you know, going to therapy the first time I walked in hoping that they would just wave, wave a magic wand and I would be cured and I'd walk out. I wouldn't have to go back again, but it didn't happen. And so I kind of dropped in and out of therapy for quite a number of years and trialed different medications, which, you know, I don't think they were really targeting the OCD. They were targeting the depression, anxiety, et cetera. And, and OCD to, to some extent has been classified as an anxiety condition, but now I'm learning that it's more probably of a neurodiverse condition as well, because the way the brain thinks in an OCD brain is very different to someone with anxiety. And so for the, I think over 10 years, jumping in and out of, of therapy, more targeting the depression. But it wasn't until I, I burned out in 2020 and I started an Instagram page for Mindful Men, just trying to, to share my story as a part of my recovery process. And through Instagram of all places, like I've never been a big social media person, but through Instagram, I started connecting with people and, and I noticed all these OCD you know, pages, the theme pages come up and I'm like, oh, I didn't really know that there were other people with OCD. I felt like I was the only person in the world who, who lived with OCD because we don't talk about it. I mean, even in Australia, there's no association for OCD or, or non-for-profit for OCD. There are overseas, but not for Australia. And so I started like yeah, checking out their pages and I noticed everyone was talking about this thing called ERP, which is Exposure Response Prevention. And I'm like, oh, what's this? And they're saying that's the gold standard for treatment for OCD. And, and I'm like, oh, okay. And I kind of parked that for a little bit, but then as during stressful times and particularly burnout was quite a stressful thing. That's a chronic stress issue. My OCD ramped up again. And I know, and I noticed this over my life that when I'm stressed, when I'm anxious, when I'm not in a good space, my OCD is a lot worse than when I'm calm and, and everything is going well. And so I thought oh, I might, yeah, look up ERP. Can I find a therapist in Australia? And, and a couple of things came up on the Sunshine, Sunshine Coast. There's not a huge amount of um, providers up here that do OCD specific treatment. And, but I did find one and, and I, you know, got a, a, a mental health care plan again. I've been, I've had a few over the years and, and went on, went off to this, this um, therapy, which I found out comes under the, you know, the cognitive behavioral therapy you know, umbrella. Um, but what, CBT does it tries to just change you know identifies the unhelpful thoughts and behaviors and kind of change that whereas ERP specifically tries to focus on preventing the compulsive act or the compulsion and so an example would be that I've got one with my car so when I park my car I have to make sure that it's in park and the handbrakes up and I would often get out the car and walk away but then walk back to the car because mm. I would be worried that the car would roll down a hill and kill people, <laughs> swathes of people. This is the image that comes into my mind straight away. And so we'd go out to the um to the to the car park actually. And I think I could do this because it was a flat car park, and I always had that disclaimer. But even in even when the car was on a flat surface, me actually not putting the handbrake on and walking away was a huge trigger. And so we'd do that. We'd go outside and we'd we'd take the handbrake off and. We'd, we'd walk only 10 metres away from the car, but we, we also wouldn't look at the car because that's part of the compulsion as well, is looking at the car. And we would sit there with our, our backs turned and and count to 10. And so we'd, then we'd, we'd, we'd watch the anxiety rise and rise and rise. Mm. And then we'd come to a point where it wasn't rising anymore. And then we can go, oh, I've reached the peak of the anxiety arc. And now I'm starting to come down again. And then we turn around and go, oh, the car's still there. And so this is a, a great example of ERP. The tricky thing with, well, there's another, another one we did was around uh, virtual reality. And so we'd put the head, the, the, cause I, you know, there's a lot of social anxiety that I, I have, and I do certain things when I'm on public transport, for example, the problem with um, virtual reality for me is that it felt like a video game. So I've grown up playing video games. So I kind of knew that it wasn't reality. And so it wasn't triggering me. And so that was an interesting thing because for other people, that's a great way to trigger their OCD. But for me, I, I was, I was trained <laughs> through my misspent youth playing video games. I knew it wasn't real. And so 
But the, the tricky thing for me was that a lot of my OCD stuff happens at nighttime where the, the psychologist couldn't be. They couldn't, you know, they weren't going to come to my house at 10 or 11 o'clock at night and, and watch me do my, my thing. And so what we started to do was, was change the way that I did certain things at home. So I mentioned before that when I check the house, I check it in a specific order. So it might be one, two, three, four, five. And so what we started to do was just change the order up try to change my, the way my brain thinks about locking up the house because it knows I have to do things one, two, three, four, five. But what happens if I started with five and went down mm-hmm. to one? Or what happens if I went, you know, one, three, two, five, four, and just really messed up the, the routine and I'd, I'd be zigzagging around the house and, and doing that. But then also it could get to the stage where I go, what happens if I don't do number three? And I did, and they, these are hugely triggering for me to not do it in specific routines because those routines weren't just right. And so this is this is all part of preventing the response that my brain is training me to do, and it's been training me for for thirty plus yep. years. And it was really useful, and and you know, coupled with medication as well, and all that type of stuff. But I find what's really worked, for, you know, that's been really good. But what's re- also worked for me well is mindfulness, and you know, I have got the mindful men platform, and and mindfulness came through my burnout and trying to experience joy and being in the moment. But I find it's also really good for OCD because it helps us be in the moment and ground ourselves and not be fixated on these obsessive thoughts that go around and around and around actually helps us disconnect from them and just be present in the moment which is really good because i've got two young kids now and often i'd be on a different planet and my kids would be saying dad 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 or my wife would be saying simon are you paying attention and i wouldn't be i'd be on a different planet because my obsessive thoughts be going around in circles so mindfulness helps me ground myself in the moment be present and also accept you know thoughts as they are and try to Treat them like anybody else would an intrusive thought. So it comes into your body, accept that it's come in and just let it go and not get stuck in a loop about why am I thinking this? What's going on? What should I do to alleviate this stress? But so yeah, ERP definitely. And I find mindfulness, yeah, particularly helpful. Oh, thanks for that detail. And it's great that you, you spoke at such length about it because it's something that I think, yeah, you're right. Some people think it's a joke. I remember seeing it for the first time in the movie is because it gets with Jack Nicholson. The sort of, it wasn't shown as a joke, then it was shown as a, as a serious thing. But um, I'm sure a lot of people listening might be thinking about themselves, oh, geez, maybe I, I might do this because there's, there are certain things. And I know when I was younger, I actually used to do, I do a little bit of this sort of stuff as well. And I don't know what happened with me, but um, I've got out of it a little, I, I don't do much of what I used to do. I always had a thing with number four. So I was always doing things four times, whatever, for whatever reason. Mm. But yeah, no, it, it, thanks for that detail. It's, it's really, really insightful. And you said something I want to pick up then on, real quickly was about trying to experience joy and be in the moment. Now, I think that's a really powerful thing that you said and that you're able to recognize in yourself because I'm not speaking for other people. I'm sort of am, but I think a lot of people do, we do struggle with that is being in the moment. And you can, when you're talking to someone, sometimes you can see they're in another another place or whatever, or if they're supposed to be with their family or whatever, they're thinking about something completely different, whether it be work or whatever it is. So maybe do you want to elaborate on that, what you just said then and go into mm. about the mindfulness part and actually explain to people because people might hear the term mindfulness and go mindfulness, you know, what is that a bit woo woo? Actually explain <laughs> about what mindfulness is to you and how that's been able to make you live in the moment more and enjoy and have more enjoyment in life because that's a really powerful thing to talk about. I was first introduced to mindfulness through burnout. So when I burned out, anyone, I'm sure you, I could do another episode on burnout if you want, mm. but burnout is, it, it saps the joy from you. You feel like everything is just so, so bad in the world. You're, you're cynical, you're fed up. And I burnt it. I, I literally hit a wall and I spent five months off of work recovering and I was just a couch potato. And even that watching TV, I had no joy. Even the kids were jumping around with me and I had no joy. I was just mm-hmm. lost in the moment. And it wasn't just the burnout though. It was it was the mental health. It was living with OCD, depression, anxiety. So these things ramp up as well. And, and I just struggled to have joy in my life. And, and so through through mindfulness, my first introduction to that was gratitude and doing a, doing a gratitude journal. And I started with that. And like most people, like you said, I thought, oh, this is a bit this is a bit girly. Look, this is a bit woo-woo. This is a bit hippie. This is not real. I'm a, I'm a guy. I shouldn't be doing this type of stuff. It doesn't make sense. The same, same goes to yoga and Pilates. And I'm going to put the three in because I did do all three of them. And I love now yoga and Pilates. But for those reasons, those, those stigmas that we essentially put on to, as guys, I I stopped doing the, the gratitude journey because I also found it a bit boring. So, mm-hmm. you know, I was told, oh, you know, 
pick three things you're grateful for every day. And it started off well. I'm like, oh, yeah, I got this, you know, the house, the family, the, the job and all this type of stuff. Even though the job burnt me out, I still had a job, it was good paying and, and all that type of stuff. But then after three, four days, I'm just regurgitating the same three things. And I'm just like, this is not working. So, I, so I've been that. I even had a gratitude journal that I went and bought. And yeah, and I've been that. <laughs> Like, what a waste of time. Mm. But then, so I left that for about oh, 12 months and then I fell in another pit and I was I was really down. And, and so I'm like, okay, back to psychology. This, you know, I know now that when I'm down, I've got to get and talk to someone. And this time though, the different psychologists who really specialize in mindfulness, we flip the, flip the, the discourse on it. And he goes, okay, you've done the three things every day. Most people don't like that. What we're going to do is separate your day into hourly chunks on a piece of paper. And I want you to write down all the boring things or that you think is boring, just just everything that you do. So it could be six to seven, having a podcast interview. It could be seven to eight, getting the kids ready for school. Eight to nine, getting myself to work. Nine to 10, having a coffee with someone at a morning, you know, through morning tea. And just go through the whole day, listing all these things that you do. And from there, those li- the list that you've now created, pick the three things that, you enjoyed doing. And so for it could be the podcast episode that I recorded, or it could be that coffee with that person at work because we had a really good conversation. Or it could be, it could even be the five minute conversation I had with my son after school. He told me a told me a joke. They're the things that I'm grateful for. And I, I'm like, you know what? Like all of a sudden I'm not regurgitating the same three things because no two days mm-hmm. are really the same. And I'm finding the things that also starting to bring me joy. So like I'm a big coffee, you know, coffee mad in this house. And, and so, you know, really discovering the different types of coffee. Like if we changed up the coffee, this gives me joy. And or, you know, being able to spend half an hour on a guitar and just playing a guitar for half an hour, which I don't do as much as I used to. But every time I do it, I feel good afterwards. Or, you know, going outside, my son started playing soccer. So we, we, we go out the backyard and we kick the ball around and, and just having some fun with that. And so these little things that we often overlook because we're on autopilot in Mm. life, we just take it for granted. These are things through mindfulness and being present in that moment and and recording my day like that was really good. And then so I took also had to take mindfulness a step further. So when I was recovering from burnout, I was trying to start moving again because I'd stopped exercising. I had this mysterious back pain that I couldn't quite pinpoint. And then what that worked, what I worked out was after all the scans and the specialists said that they couldn't figure out what it was, was actually a response to my mental state. So once I started to recover from the burnout, my back pain disappeared and I was able to start walking again. So something very basic. And what I would do is I would walk around the local park here. We've got a little bit of a lake where, and I would brush my hands across the trees as I walked past them. Or I would stop for a moment and watch the trees swaying in the wind or watch the clouds go past if there's a, it's a windy day. And I really started to use my five senses. You know, I might be grabbing some leaves and crunching them mm. in my hand and smell smell the, the smell that comes from that. And what I was finding is just using these five senses, I was able to, to you know, be present on the walk because I, I, I hated going for a walk and being on autopilot and not realizing that I was on the walk. I was thinking about all the other things, but I really loved when I was able to come back to the walk and just be present on that walk. And so I've now taken that five senses thing and I've got a program that I do through Mindful Men called Mindfulness on the Move, where I take you know my clients and we do exactly that. We go and brush hands on trees and we go to the beach and put our feet in the water and we just really sit there and go, okay, what are we feeling right now? Let's not think about anything else. Let's just think about where our feet are and what we're doing right now. And so these, all these little things was really cool. But then as I was was finishing my social work degree at the time, so I was starting part-time as a master's degree and I was doing a practice, you know, we had to do 500 hours of practical work at a business. So that was really cool learning about private practice and therapy in a business. And through there, I was also introduced to Dr. Russ Harris, who, who does a lot of work in the acceptance and commitment therapy space, the ACT. And this is a mindfulness-based practice. And so what I was now learning was not so much as a client, which I, I still use as a client myself, but then also as a therapist, how then you apply that to, to, to the therapy practice. And so I discovered here that, oh, mindfulness and, and acceptance and commitment therapy, that's around gratitude and being present in the moment. There's also you know breathing exercises that you can use to overcome things like anxiety. But then there's also this other cool thing which I had never thought about was values. And it was around identifying what your values are, then using those four to six core values that we identify out of, I don't know, 40 or 50, 
and using them as compasses every day. And it's going, okay, how am I going to live by my values today? So if my value is respect, how am I going to re- to show respect to other people, but also yeah. almost command respect from other people as well? And it, and then we do that in in committed ways and in, in intentional ways. And then if we're not living by our values, how is that making us feel? So often when we're triggered, for example, by with anger, it's sometimes it's someone who's who's triggering against one of our values. So if we're if our value is respect and we're not getting respected and we get triggered by that. We can use our values to to reflect on that and go, oh, you know, this is why I'm I'm feeling like this, possibly, but it's because I'm not being respected in this moment. And so it, it's it's all these types of things. And then so I look at it as a big thing as and going, okay, well, mindfulness is all these tools, but then it's also okay, reflecting on, you know, on life, on my journey, on the journey of my clients, and acknowledging that because if they our stories tell amazing things about us, about our resilience, our strengths our weaknesses as well and it's it's around accepting that into our lives it's around then using that to go am i showing up as the person that i want to be am i on autopilot can i come off of autopilot can i live more authentically but then also what's the goals for the future how can i now you know take all this knowledge i have about myself and use it to to drive change in my life and and live that life that i've always wanted to live and not the life that i've been living because i've been mm. on autopilot I love all that advice. I was was typing some notes there. And I love the thing which you said about the values and having your own set of values. I don't think people even know what their values are or take the time. And it's a great way to look at it because you're right. If someone says something that's against, like, let's say respect, as you said, is a great example. Um, Yeah, it's just being able to identify and label it, what your values are, can definitely really help. And a lot of good advice. The five senses thing is an interesting thing as well. I actually was reading an article the other day about that and basically, you know, taste and touch and and how it can really drastically affect um, um, your mood. And it's a really, really good example. You said that you do with your clients of just taking them into the to the beach or when you're going for your own walk. It's fan- really good, fantastic stuff you were saying then. Um, just want to talk real quickly, if you can, before, I, know, I think you had a hard out at seven. Is it, do you be, be, be gone by seven? No. Nah. Okay. Well, what I want to, because I want to just talk about burnout. So burnout, um, as you have alluded to a couple of times before, something's very real. And I think, Post COVID, I'm I'm in Melbourne, Victoria, so it's sort of we're slowly seeing. I think the post COVID mental health effects now, um, especially in, in young kids, in young kids down here, but in just in general, I think it's still a very weird time in, in Melbourne, Victoria, um, with what's going on at the moment. So maybe you want to talk about your story of burnout and how you made a transition to what you're doing now. Yeah, absolutely. Burnout is something you know. I worked in a public service in, a, in an environment that was high. KPIs, so key performance indicators. And there was a lot of turnover of staff, a lot of turnover of process. And I look back on my time at the agency. So I worked at the National Disability Insurance Agency. So I'm going to name it. I've named it before. So like there's no no lie where I worked. And it was an amazing job. Like I met so many people living with disability, telling their amazing stories like this, you know, like what we've been doing and overcoming adversity. And, and I was fortunate to be the, you know, one of the, well, they used to call, they call them a planner where you'd sit down and hear these stories and go, okay, what does, what's the disability supports you need? And I was fortunate, you know, to press approve on the funding. That was a fantastic, it was such a great feeling to press approve and go, hopefully this money can make a difference to this mm-hmm. person's life and this family's life and goes because often families that would come in the tra- the challenge with the the agency and the scheme was and still is is that it was high KPIs so you know you'd do one piece of work and then the next next the next job would be there ready to go and ready to press approve and this was awesome you know you can do that for a while and i think for the first 12 months we did it really well as as an agency or particularly up here on the sunshine coast we did it really well but then after 12 12 months of doing that over and over and over again like it's like a conveyor belt of work and people started to burn out and i didn't realize that they were burning out like i was still doing okay like my perfection i was hitting that bar of perfectionism that i'd i'd had for a long time i'd i'd been in the public service for a long time so i'd experienced similar environments in other agencies and i was doing okay and then gradually over time i just started to feel tired and i started to feel like i wasn't keeping up as 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 well as i used to and i started getting more cynical and started just feeling terrible and and starting to be terrible around other people particularly my wife for example what i discovered was you know 
well, actually didn't rediscover it. Like other people were going off on leave and, and, and I thought, oh, they're taking a lot of holidays. What's going on here? But I never really asked. It wasn't really my business and, and so forth. And then I started to hear this word burnout a, a few times. And I'm like, what's burnout? I hadn't really heard that before. And this is only a couple of years ago now. And then I learned, oh, maybe it's just like, a, I heard it's a workplace stress thing. Maybe they just can't be bothered. You know, they like, it's a cop-out thing. I kind of, I think I initially thought of it as a cop-out thing. I've never heard of it, never experienced it. What is it? And that was until I experienced it myself. So it got to a point where, it got to a point where I, I would be in meetings with clients and I wouldn't be present. I would, you know, get 10 minutes into the, the conversation and I'd be leading that 10 minutes. I was saying something for 10 minutes, but then realizing I have no idea what I've just been talking about for 10 minutes. And I don't know what even what part of the conversation we're up to. And, and so that, that was a big red flag for me. And that happened a few times. I'm like, okay, something's not quite right here. And then my workloads were, were blowing out time. You know, I wasn't as quick as I used mm. to be. I was always a bit slower than a lot of other people. And I think that's the perfectionism coming through in, in what I do. Whenever I write case notes, I'm a, a war and peace kind of guy. I'm not the four dot points kind of guy. And so it always took me a lot longer to do some work. And then you start comparing it to the people next to you. And in a high KPI environment, that comparison culture really is bad because some person might have 10 easy things to do. And then they'd be like, oh yeah, you're a champion. You're doing amazing work. And then I've got a really hard thing to do. And I barely get through one. And they're like, Simon, why have you only done one instead of this person's done 10? And it was a thing. Comparison culture was a thing. And after a couple of years, I think it was about two years, we'd hit COVID. So we were in lockdown as well up here in Queensland. I think it was the first lockdown that everyone was in. And I noticed you know, the gym had closed and I was, mm. I was trying to, to run around the block and plus my own mental health story as well. The OCD, depression, anxiety wasn't still there. I was studying masters of social work part-time, working full-time. We're all at home. <laughs> it was just chaos like everyone experienced. And it got to a point where I was, I was having a meeting with my boss and, and, and we we're going to talk about my caseload because it was blowing out. And I just, something inside of me just bubbled up and, and I think the, the lid burst and I just started crying and I'd never done that before in the workplace or anything like that. Nobody in the workplace knew I lived with OCD, depression, anxiety. And so this was the first time a mental health story was coming out for me in the workplace. They're like, what's wrong, Simon? I'm like, and I was at home. So I was disconnected, you know, we're doing this via Zoom or, or not even that we're on the phone. I'm like, I don't know. Like, I think I'm burnt out. And I just said the word. I didn't really know what it was. And so I went to the doctor, my GP. And I love this doctor because I've got two doctors. I've got a, a GP that we, the family uses. Doesn't really get into the mental health space. He's great, he's great to talk to about mental health. But this other doctor was a specific mental health. You know, his, his interest was mental health. And I said to him, like, these are the things that I'm feeling. And he said, Simon, this is burnout. You've, and, and what I liked about him, he said, I've been here before. I've been burnt out. So what you're saying, I understand. And I'm like, oh, really? And then so we, we, we explored what burnout was. It's that prolonged chronic stress that doesn't get alleviated. That saps your joy. That's you know makes you cynical. That makes you you know always questioning what's the point of everything. You know, it's not just a workplace thing. It seeps into everything. You know, study, family life, social circles, everything. It's not just a workplace thing. And so he said, oh, "I have two weeks off." So I had two weeks off and went back to work, and that didn't help. And I basically just crumbled again. And then literally, he said, "Have you got any any sick leave?" And I and I was fortunate because I had worked in the public service for fifteen years. I'm like, "Yeah, I've got six months sick leave." He's like, "Well, do you want to say six months?" I'm like, "Oh, probably not. <laughs> I'll take three months." And he, and he's like. I was going to say three months as well. So I took three months off and telling work, hey, I'm not going to be back for three months. Yeah. So that was a big thing. And and so that's through that process, I went and saw a mental health social worker because studying social work. So I wanted, I'd never seen a social worker before. I'd always seen psychologists and counselors or psychiatrists. And I thought, oh, I'm going to try a mental health social worker because I, I I understood the language and I loved social work and, and, and what we we're talking about. But the great thing about the social worker that I went and saw is that A, she'd worked in a public service. So she worked in a similar agency to what I was working in and she'd experienced burnout too. So I was hitting you know two you know big green ticks there because I could go in there and say it as it was and they would just understand what I was talking about. And this is what I value now today as a therapist, as a lived experience therapist, when guys come to me with depression, anxiety, burnout, no one's come to me with OCD yet, but I'm hoping one day they do, I will get it. 
I, w- I mean, I won't get it in their shoes because it's their story. They everyone has their own story and their and their own paths they walked on. But I can get it when they say this is how I'm feeling. I, I totally get. It. I can get it when they say I've, you, I use alcohol to numb the pain because that's what I've done for most of my life. And so through that that process of of return of, of recovery, I, I started doing things like I was with the walking thing that I was talking about before. One of the creative things I started doing was I've got a MacBook Air. And there's a, there's a program on there called Garage Band. And I've never been a DJ. I always, you know, you, you had these dreams of doing something musical as a young person. But I, they, I found that on this program, they had these loops. So I was able to loop music together and pretend I was a DJ for two hours uh, every couple of days or once a week. And what I found was, A, that that helped me just focus on one thing and not 500 things. But it also had this creative outlet, which gave me joy, which is really cool. And then I thought, well, what can I do with it once I've, I've finished putting these loops together? And I'm like, oh, I'm going to start a YouTube channel and, and start putting the music up there. Because what I found was, found was when I was studying, the music that I was listening to was just music that had no words. It was just instrumental music which I helped found helped me focus as well. And so yeah, that's why I listen to. Yeah. yeah. And so I put it up on, on YouTube and, you know, I think I'm the only person who's ever listened to them, <laughs> but it just felt like this great sense of accomplishment. I'm like, all of a sudden I was finding joy again. I was accomplishing things again and it just felt great. And so when I went back to work, it was a graduated return. So I, I went back to work like one or two days a week and then it got to five days. And then we started graduating my workload as well, getting me back up to full-time equivalent. And it just, it, it coincided with a gap in study, which was, which was helpful because I had a gap in my semesters um, where I was able just to go back to work. I was able to recover, go back to work and do that. But it was a long process. And, and what I discovered through that is, is all those people that were on leave, they weren't on leave for holidays, they were on leave for burnout. Because when I came back and I, I actually shared my burnout story coming back into the workplace, I felt it was necessary because of the environment it was. And thankfully, my manager said, yeah, I'd love, we'd love to hear this burnout story. And other people would come to me and say, yeah, Simon, I've been burnt out too, or I'm, or I'm approaching burnout. What should I do? And I say, oh, go see your doctor. You need, to, you need to get on top of this because for me, it was three months off of work. And I know a lot of the people in the agency that or in the office that I had didn't have that leave because they were brand new to the, to the APS, you know, mm-hmm. when we all started in 2018. And, and so, yeah, I was just fortunate. I had the leave available and, and had the support from my managers at the time, whereas 12 months earlier, if that happened 12 months or even maybe six months earlier, I don't think I would have had that same support because we were talking pre-COVID then and the discussions were just suck it up and get on with your work. Whereas once COVID hit, and one of the good things about COVID is we started looking at mental health a lot closer. And particularly when we became all remote workers, you know, managers were checking in, how are you coping at the moment? And I think it just coincided. That was one of the best things about COVID was these increases in discussions around mental health. Yeah, if I burnt out, 12 months earlier, I don't know if this, if I'd have the same story of recovery and going back to work. It probably, it might've led to me quitting that job. And I don't know what I'd be doing now. I probably wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now as a therapist because my path would have been different. And how did you make the transition to what you're doing now? So I sense a bit that you wanted to work with something that really meant, you know, obviously you're doing meaningful work with, with what you're doing, but in regards to what you're doing now, you want to create something which really gave you a real sense of purpose. So maybe you want to talk about how you created what you've done and how you've made the transition into social work. Because I I grew up with a lot of social workers. My mum was always in psych wards, so I've known I've had a lot to do with social workers growing up. So always a lot of respect for social workers. So maybe you want to talk about how you made that transition into that. It was a long time coming. So I remember like it was the end of the nineties, early early noughties, and and you get back then it was like, well, what do you want to do when you finish high school? And I'm like. And, every, and I had this big book, like this thick around, like an inch thick around all the different uni courses. Mm. And, and nobody in my household had, had, I think my brother had gone to uni, but never finished uni. So like going to uni was a big thing in our household. And in fact, where we lived in the school I went to, I got bonus points because I was from a, a um, disadvantaged area to get into uni. So that was, I had a few extra bonus points to get in. And I remember at that time, I'm like, didn't know what mental health was because we weren't talking about it. But I felt inside of me, I said, so I, I, just, I said to myself, I, I want to do something that helps someone like me go through whatever I'm going through. And so I picked, so I picked a social science degree and it was majoring in psychology. I'm like, oh, maybe. So I've heard of this term psychology. I don't know what a psychologist does really, but they might help 
people process stuff and, and behaviors. And, and that's what the little blurb in the book said. And so off I went and started that. But then in the second year, and I started the first year I got through and the second year I got to a, a, a course that was around statistics, advanced statistics. And I bombed it. I just, I, maths for me, I just don't get it. It's like a foreign language. And so I ended up um, changing changing courses to anthropology. And that's how I kind of ended up in the public service because at the end of it, Google wasn't around at the time. It was AOL or Yahoo or something mm. like that. I said, what does someone who has a social science degree do? And it just said, oh, here's all these government graduate jobs. And so that's the path that I went on. And so I parked this idea of working with people like me because I couldn't finish the degree, the psychology degree. It was too hard. Fast forward to, oh, it would have been 2015 or so, 2013, sorry. And I was I was sick of the public service. By that time, like I had lots of cool jobs, but it wasn't lighting me up and I wasn't climbing the ladder. And I'm like, you know, I've got to go do some more study. And then I, I happened to walk into the local university here on the Sunshine Coast. And, and I wish I did this 10 years earlier, but like I, I spoke to a careers counsellor. I said, oh, I want to do some study. I don't really know what to do. Um, my sister-in-law at the time was doing an occupational therapy. I'm like, yeah, oh, that sounds really interesting by the way she talks about it. And so we looked at that, but then he's like, well, what do you want to do? And I'm like, well, I kind of want to help people process stuff. And now I had a name. So I said, oh, I want to help people with mental health. You know, I've always wanted to do this. Uh, I, had the, I had the terminology now that I'd had the diagnosis you know, 12, 11 years ago. He said, what about social work? and or counseling and we looked at both options and counselors i was like oh, i don't want to be stuck to a chair all day i want to be creative because creativity is something really important to me and it's lo i lost it after high school and he said oh well, social workers can just do anything like you can work in child protection you can work mm -hmm. in hospitals you can have your own business you can work in community development you know organizations and i'm like oh that sounds really cool. No two days are going to be the same because I've been doing the same, same, same for the last 10 years of my public service career. And so that's why I picked social work. But then the very first subject I picked was mental health in Australia. Let's be like that. I just loved it. It just, it, it enlivened my brain. I'm like, oh, this is amazing. And then I learned social workers can do accreditation and become a mental health social worker. I'm like, this is the job I want. I want to be an accredited mental health social worker. And so that's the journey I, I took. And, and, and from there, everything I did, all the subjects I did, if I had to do a report, it would be something to do with either mental health or men's health or men's well-being and, and trying to, to encompass all that and, and learn so much about that as possible. And then it was interesting when I finished the degree or was coming close to finishing the degree, I, I, I'd heard of other people having jobs outside of the public service. And I thought, oh, I'd love to, to do that. So I started on the process of getting the approvals from my managers to say, hey, I want to go make some extra income, but outside of this organization. And because I was only a brand new graduate, like it takes two years to get your accreditation to be a mental health social worker. And to do that, you have to work in mental health field, which is really hard to get into without the experience. Mm. And so I thought, oh, I'm going to start my own business. I'm sick of working for other people. I want to, I want to have my own private practice. And so what I'll do is I'll, I'll do Fridays or Saturdays, and I'm going to have clients on those, those days. And then I'll have my normal job Monday to Thursday, which gives me salary, which is, you know, I need to pay the mortgage and all that type of stuff. And they knocked it back and they said, well, you know, because I was, I, was, I was also going to um, target, you know, NDIS participants as well, because there's therapy in that. And they said, they knocked it back and said, you can't do NDIS because you work in the NDIS. It's conflict of interest. And I'm like, oh, okay, I understand that. But it gutted me because I'm like, mm. how am I going to find private paying clients to, to work with this brand new graduate and, and so forth? Much easier in the NDIS, but not so easy in private practice as a private paying client. And so I kind of sat on it and sat on it and sat on it, tried again, tried to tweak the, the application a little bit, didn't work again. And I fell into a really dark pit of depression. And I'm like, how can I do this? I, I really want to get out. I want to have my own business. I want to help guys with their mental health, but I can't. I'm stuck in this old job because I'm tied to a mortgage. You know, I've got a mortgage to pay. I've got kids in school. You know, I've got a very good salary with good conditions. And it's funny how it came about because at the time, and this is all through COVID and the towards the end of COVID, we thought, oh, I'd love to get a new car. Like my old Corolla was dying. I needed to get a new car. I'm like, oh, I want to get a Ute. So we put a we put a we took 60 grand out of the mortgage and I was going to put that to a brand new Hilux. I've always wanted a Hilux because it had mm. the initials SR on the back and that's my initials. <laughs> it's a stupid reason to want a car. And 
and we did that and my wife's like oh you know if that if that if you feel like that's going to be good that'll be good because we can take the kids away we can go camping we can do all the things that people in southeast queensland do and and we did that but then we we put one on order and because of covid it was going to be initially six months then it was nine months then it was 12 months now i'm hearing 18 to 24 months mm-hmm. to get the car delivered from overseas and after about three or four months i just got sick of waiting and i said to my wife you know i was in a really bad place at work and i said why don't we just take half of that money buy a secondhand new and then take the other half that can be the mortgage payments while i build the business from for full you know five days a week from from scratch and and so, Usually when I have these ideas, my wife is like, nah, that's not going to happen. We've got to think logically about this, Simon. We're going to do the, the gradual thing. And she's like, no, what? You know what? Let's do it. And so we did. We we went down to Brizzy. I got a secondhand uh, Toyota Hilux with SR on the back. And, and then I've put Mindful Men stickers all over it. But then I, I remember calling up work and it was really scary because I'd never resigned from that career. I mean, I'd, I'd moved agencies, which is pretty allowable in the public service, but to say that I'm leaving the public service, thanks for everything. And thanks for my mental health journey as well. <laughs> you know, because that, that was a big contributor to it. I'm going to go live this passion that I've always had since I was a teenager and I'm, and I'm going to move into that space. And so created the website, created the business name and, or, you know, the trading name and and just opened up the doors to Google. I said, you know, put in Google ads and all this type of stuff. And, and interesting, like everyone's like, Simon, this is so much needed. But then the phone didn't ring. And I'm like, what have I done? Like, and I was struggling with it. And then, you know, I got a few business coaches on board and started started networking and through the network, started getting the referrals. And, and then, yeah, now we're in a really good space, of, you know, at probably about 60% capacity now. It opened in August last year, but 60% capacity now and doing some great things and now starting to look at doing some group work as well so it's been a bit of a journey and i put the car story in there because we often we live in a in a consumerist world where we want the big shiny things we want to keep up with the people next door or whatever and by me flipping that and going you know what i don't need the new one i can have the old one and then i can actually use this money for my real purpose and since leaving my old job, I've just been totally different. The depression's gone. Stress is still there because now I'm a small business owner. And it's, you know, and, and I'm worried that burnout might come and go and 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 anxiety comes. And and it's been a few times where I've been teetering on the edge. And I and that's when I've got to recognize I've got to step back. Don't be so perfect perfect with everything. Try to to rid that perfectionist out of me and go easy on myself as well. I'm a you know, I'm new to business. I'm discovering all these business things. I'm making mistakes, but I'm learning from them at the same time. But what really lights me up is, yeah, working with the guys that I work with and and seeing them open their eyes to mindfulness and and or just talk for the first time. And I often say, oh, we walk into sessions and I say, just give me your baggage. If that's all we do, just give me your baggage and I'll keep your baggage. And you can just walk away free. And, and it's just an amazing thing. It's a great thing to do. And I'm so glad I'm doing it. And yeah, we're about... Well, August this year will be one year and then I've got another 12 months and then I've become an accredited mental health social worker. That's fantastic. Yeah, no, it's amazing achievement. Look, I work with a lot of businesses in my well, people. I work with a lot of, so I work for the gyms group, which is like gyms, mowing, gyms, cleaning. And we have 100, 100 to 20 new franchisees coming every three to four weeks. And it's similar to you. They're leaving 20 years or they've been retrenched or it's the same thing. They're all the anxieties and the same worry about, you know, but they're coming into something, whereas you've mm. built your own thing from scratch, which is completely different and a lot harder. So you're nearly a year into business. So how have you, maybe do you want to talk about your business? What what do you offer in it? What's your point of difference? Because I think everyone generally has got an idea of what a psychologist does, but in regards to what you're, you're doing, how's it different? Is it something where government funding is available? Can people go to a mental health, get a mental health plan and come to you or how does it all work or? Yeah. So mindful men. So it's just me at the moment. I have this dream of versions of me driving around in Hiluxes across Australia doing what I do, but basically it's, it's therapy. It's like going to a counselor or a psychologist or another mental health social worker. And we focus on mindfulness based practice. So we talked about acceptance and commitment therapy before that's a bulk of what I do. It's all around mindfulness. It's around values, identification, sitting with anxiety, but also there's a few other tools and tips that I, I do as well but I don't do it necessarily in a clinic. So I do have a clinic space. Some people like coming into a clinic, but mm. I actually get out and about in the community and I say to the guys, let's go to the beach or I come to your house. I drive all across the Sunshine Coast and, and we do what I call experiential therapy, which is that walking and brushing our hands on the leaves and it's getting our feet in the water. There was one guy that loved playing basketball 
So we'd go down and shoot hoops and and I'd, we'd have a chat. And, and what it looks like on the outside is just two guys talking, mm. but I'm bringing in all these therapeutic tools in the background and, 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 you know, asking the right questions from a therapy perspective. There's another guy that likes video games. There's another guy that likes to go and get kebabs. And so that's what we do. We just do these everyday things, but I'm bringing in therapy in, in, in the sides and in the back and, 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 and around the place. And so that's why it's a little bit different because if you go to a psychologist and counselor, the majority of them, 99% of them would just sit in a clinic they do six sessions a day you know very sterile it's it's you know you're sitting there it's very trans almost feels really transactional obviously yeah. like they have to be there you know it's sort of absolutely yeah. listen there's a guy that i walk his dog with or we go same guy he he's he's a bit of a smoker so and he lives in a in, in a residential kind of situation with his ndis so we just drive down to the local coles and get him a pack of cigarettes like it's his only outing for the week yeah some- yeah which is yep and that seems like, oh, that's more of a support worker thing, but it's it, but I'm doing the therapy as we're driving to the to the coals and while we're waiting for the cigarettes or, or whatever, we're bringing all these like tools and mindfulness tools and tricks and so forth. Um, I do do telehealth and, and telephone Australia wide. So I've got clients Australia wide that I see a little bit harder to do the experiential stuff, but we can still work around that as well. So I do the values. I've got, you know, a pack of cards these values cards here that I go through and I can mm. just move the camera down if we're doing it by video and we can go through, or I can describe the cards to people over the phone if they prefer the phone. I've got a few guys that they're like, oh, no, I'm just a phone kind of guy. That's cool. So it is, it is varied, and and but it's all mindfulness. It's all around debunking the thing. And I bring in a lot of lived experience. So the sessions aren't about me and my experience, but when someone says to me, Simon, do you know what it's like to feel depressed? Hell yeah, this is, and I'll give them some examples. Or do you know what it's like to struggle with parenting? I'm, yeah, I'm a parent. I'm a dad too. Like I, I don't hide away from my true authentic self because I did that for so long in the public service. And so, yeah, it, it is it is different in the sense that it's outdoors a lot. It's at people's homes. It's it's on the road. And it's a bit more just like guys talking as opposed to a very clinical, sterile type environment. So that's how I do it. Um, in terms of how people can fund it. So because I'm not accredited mental health social worker, I don't accept the mental health care plans or mental mental health treatment plan referrals because I'm not I'm not linked in with Medicare that's the only reason why so I do just a private fee for service so you can book in and pay my fee and that's it or if you're on the NDIS so now that I'm out of the NDIS uh, working for the agency I, I actually accept a lot of NDIS referrals and that's the bulk of my work and I absolutely love that work because it's so it's so cool. And those guys are very much up for creative therapies. They're not the ones that want to sit in clinics. They want to do things differently. So I love that space as well. So yeah, in 12 months time, I'm working towards that accreditation. That's when the Medicare stuff comes in and that's when the private health stuff comes in as well. So that's something that will come yeah, in 12 months time. Fantastic. And you mentioned something that which I think is really important is, is the lived experience part where someone can come in and they know if you've got that lived experience, it's, a, it's an instant level of more let's say respect. Oh, um, that's the way I felt. So for my example was like, when I was younger, I'd always, whoever's treating my mum's psychologist, I would say, do you, like as a kid, I'd say, do you have a parent with the same thing? And I'd say, no. And it's like, well, I instantly, I would not listen to them. Mm. Like that was just my, my stubbornness. So I think it's really, really important. What you do is being open online so that when people are researching for it and come across you, I oh, call cool, this guy's been through the same things I'm dealing with at the moment. I'm going to engage with him and have an instant level of respect from day one. Whereas if someone goes to a psychologist, I don't like every psychologist is different. It's different people, but yeah, it's a, there's a sussing out process and it's not really about them. You're going to find out if it's, it's obviously they're going to be interested in you. But I think by having that level of, of um, you're putting your story out there first and you, they will know about you and what's and all before coming to you. It just makes it, I just think you get a way more cut through and a better session and a more productive one doing it with someone like you as opposed to maybe going into more controlled environment or the traditional environment. Yeah, and that's why I do what I do. That's why I do the podcast. It's initially, it was to share the story and, and show guys that it's okay to talk about what's going on. But also now I use it as a bit of a marketing thing and I, and I if I'm getting a new referral and maybe it's someone who's not sure about coming to therapy, I always just say, go check out my social media or go check out my podcast. I'm on YouTube as well. And just listen to me and listen to the things I talk about. And if that, you know, if you, if you like that vibe, cool, we might be a good fit. But if you know, that's also a cool thing as well, because mm. it's really important to have that good relationship with the therapist, one that's respectful, one that's open, one that's honest as well. And if you're not feeling comfortable, like that's a red flag, you've got to move on. And I've done that myself. And, and through my own journey now, when I need to go and see a, a counselor or a psychologist or a social worker, 
I will interview them, like kind of like what you were doing. I'd interview them and say, what's your experience with this? And that's what I did with OCD. I said, what's your experience with OCD? And I had to go through a few uh, companies to find the right fit because they, they would say, oh yeah, we're experiencing OCD, but that's the senior guy, which you're not going to see. You're going to see the junior person and they're going to get supervision. I'm like, no, I want the person with mm. the experience. That's the one I want. And particularly for OCD, what I've got, I've got dreams of, you know, doing some training in, in ERP myself as a therapist. You know, I've got that as a client, as a clinic, uh, you know, as a person accessing it. And then hopefully, you know, increase ERP avail training availability in Australia because there's not many you know courses available for ERP in Australia. You have to go overseas. Um, there's a little bit of exposure therapy, but it's not the same. So, yeah, that's something that's coming as well in the future. Awesome. No worries. Um, I, I will let you go now, Simon. I don't think you're six, six, six to seven, but I'd love to have you back on again sometime to keep going on. Thank you for sharing as much detail. It's great for me. I can sit back and listen and learn. It was fantastic. So thank you for providing all that information. And if people want to learn more about what you do and your podcast, maybe you want to give that a bit of a plug in and with the uh, web address as well. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the website is www.mindful-men.com.au. Access my therapy information, but also some social media stuff there as well. I'm all over pretty much most of the, the social media, but also the Mindful Men podcast is available. Apple, Spotify, also on YouTube, we put the videos up there too. So yeah, come subscribe and join the conversation. Awesome. Thank you very much today for your um, all your information. So I'm really enjoyable listening actually. So thank you very much for that. And um Really good luck on your business. It's a fantastic. I love people who take a risk and they follow something they're passionate about. It's really important to do. And you've done it the hard way because I I work in with Jim's Marketing and stuff. It's easy for someone to walk into our business and be successful. But for you to do it from scratch in something like this, which is a, which is a newer sort of thing you're creating, massive amount of respect for someone who does that. So well done on that. And um, congratulations on everything you've done. And I'm going to follow your journey with interest and hopefully have you back on sometime again to talk more in more detail. Yeah, thanks, John. I really appreciate what the work you're doing with the podcast as well, mate. It's really, it can be hard talking about our, our families and our own experiences, um, but you're, you're doing it and showing guys across Australia and across the world that it's okay to talk about these things. And in fact, it's an important thing to do. So thanks for all your work too. Nice. No, thanks, Simon. Appreciate it. Thanks, mate.